Hello, welcome to the Science of Policy podcast. My name, as always, is Toby, and today I'm joined by Professor Matthew Flinders, a political scientist based at the University of Sheffield in the UK. He was the founding director of the Sir Bernard Crick Centre for the Public Understanding of Politics. He's vice president of the UK's Political Studies Association, and he's currently the chair of the University's Policy Engagement Network, which works at the boundary between research and policy in Britain, and, among other things, helps universities to respond to requests for evidence from policymakers. So, Matthew, welcome to the podcast. Uh, Great to be here. Good to talk to you. Okay. We're here to talk about blame. So, talk to me about blame. Well, uh, blame is not usually a good thing. Nobody likes to be blamed for anything. And I suppose uh, the opposite of blame would be credit. And the distribution of blame and credit in life is always something that can be slightly tricky, slightly messy, uh, dare I say even slightly political. So a lot of my research in the past has been about the processes and tools through which we conduct accountability and how accountability is used to either distribute blame or more rarely distribute credit. But I'd say more precisely, I suppose what I'm really interested in is is social learning. How as a society do we learn from the past and particularly from past mistakes? And there the big issue isn't so much between blame and credit, but more between blame and lesson learning. And I think, you know, learning from failure is a big challenge, not just politically for policymakers and politicians, but also for academics more generally. Okay. And we're talking about blame in the political, like societal arena, right? Yeah. Does does that have any special features compared to blame in other situations like day to day relationships, say? I, I think it does. I think blame in the political public arena is of a very particular type. If my wife blames me for not doing some domestic chores, I might be able to argue, and very unlikely actually, but I can at least try to argue the case that I was doing something different and I might deserve credit for what I was doing instead of doing the chores. In the political realm, I'm afraid it is a very uh, low trust, high blame environment, which in itself tends to cast a shadow over how people behave. And interestingly enough, the blame dynamic isn't just about accountability for what happened. It's also about accountability for what people didn't do, because the knowledge that you are likely to be blamed for what goes wrong, no matter how positive some of the elements might have been, the the, the constant dread of being blamed for this is a very strong anticipatory factor that can often stop good things happening. Or more precisely, it stops innovations and stops sensible risk taking that may well lead to major social breakthroughs that could be incredibly productive. So very simply put, blame when it comes to the politics and political agenda is synonymous with what in the academic literature is called gotcha. That's what blame is about. Right. That's a technical term. Gotcha. Gotcha. Political science has been going for 150 years to get to that point. Gotcha. And it's about uh, scapegoating and sacrificial lambs and not wanting to end up carrying the can. And of course, the great challenge here is that social life, public policy, contemporary governance tends to be incredibly complex. Yeah. And presumably the theory, or at least the, the narrative, I suppose, behind this public attribution of blame is that the politicians we elect are the ones who are supposed to take responsibility, right? I mean, that's part of their job. We elect them to be accountable for what they do or don't do, or in general, what happens. In a way, it's part of the deal they signed up for. Part of the deal. Well, that's a very interesting phrase you've used there. I think there are, there are three dimensions, if I can remember all three of them. The first one is historical. Ministers are responsible for everything that happens in their departments. And, you know, with various different national inflections, politicians do carry the can. But you, you've got to remember that these conventions, these political understandings were born in far simpler times when the scope of the state and the reach of politicians was more direct and in many ways simpler. It was therefore possibly more realistic 
to expect politicians to take a direct and personal responsibility for what went wrong. That's changed. Um, but then there's a second element which you mentioned, which, you know, to some extent, there's a social psychological element here that politicians do become the lightning rods for social anxieties, frustration, anger. And so to that extent, the whole blame game is sometimes rooted in a complete irrationality, which is at the same time rational. It's irrational to want to blame a single person for a systemic failure. But at the same time, it's perfectly rational to want to find a scapegoat to take the blame. So there is a certain inverse rallying around the flag here that when things go wrong, we look for somebody to carry that can. And, you know, there have been many times when politicians or senior officials have effectively accepted that I'm not directly responsible. There was nothing I could really have done. But constitutionally and socially, someone's got to take the hit and that'll be me. Yeah, right. Uh, you, you, you mentioned this notion of the deal. And I think that's really important because it flows into the position of academics on this, particularly in the fields of public policy and public administration. There is a, a well-known concept around the public service bargain and how that has changed. And without going into a great deal, what we might call the old public service bargain was fairly simple. Public servants who supported politicians knew that they would enjoy a stable, permanent, long-term career. They would never make huge amounts of money, but they would have good working conditions and a good pension. And also they would be anonymous and invisible to the public. And if they did something wrong, their minister would carry the can and they wouldn't be personally to blame. I think that's what's shifted. What's often referred to as the new public service bargain is that often officials are appointed on far more precarious short term contracts. They'll often receive far higher salaries than in the past. But part of that new deal is that if something goes wrong, they will be put out in the spotlight to carry the can visibly and the minister will blame them and blame will be deflected. I think that runs across interestingly into possibly some of the things that are happening with regard to academic life. And there is a question about whether there is a new academic public service bargain that we need to recognise and think about as academics are expected to become more visible and their research to become more relevant in society. So that's a very interesting parallel. I was kind of having similar thoughts as you were talking about the, the new public service bargain. And this is something quite a few guests have reflected on on this podcast, especially since COVID, but I guess also more generally as well. Um, the world of science advice has changed over the last couple of years, so the story goes. And scientists and science advisors have become much more prominent, much more recognisable and influential. And we have multiple examples of politicians standing alongside scientists in the public eye, making joint policy pronouncements. And it's not just about COVID. And of course, I guess COVID has prompted it to a great extent because of the need for high profile science input. And I mean, one might have mixed feelings about this. So on the one hand, I think it's essential that scientific evidence is a touchstone for political decision making during a pandemic, especially. And it's good for people to understand how evidence is being heard and used and what that means, especially when they're being asked to comply with quite severe restraints to their freedoms. But then there's also what you just described, which is or, or parallel to what you just described, where a science advisor might rightly or wrongly, feel exposed to blame in this situation. Whereas in the old model, when science advice just happened behind the scenes, it was still an input into the decision, but it wasn't a public one, so it wasn't so exposed. Do you think that's right? Should science advisors be nervous now? Well, I think a lot of them will be nervous right now for a whole number of reasons we might talk about. But at a more sort of generic level, I think that sort of um, the thesis holds up. I mean, traditional scientific policy advice took place, what I would call off stage. It happened in the shadows. It wasn't the topic of media, public visibility. It was part of the hidden wiring of the research development ecosystem. Um, I think that it actually, you know, 
I would slightly disagree, and I would say it has been COVID that has fundamentally shifted and pushed the scientific advisors on stage. And, you know, there are lots of questions circulating in the academic community about whether some of the most prominent scientists really understood the games that they were being invited to partake in. So if we take a, an obvious example, the, the classic issue here would be Boris Johnson flanked literally by the chief medical advisor, chief scientific advisor, almost in a very sort of performative, ritualistic, religious framework. And of course, you know, this gave the prime minister at the time a huge amount of credibility by having these august, well-respected advisors literally over their shoulder. I, I don't want to personalise this about specific prime ministers or political parties. I think there's a broader point here. But the great benefit for the politician is that when he or she is asked with those tricky questions, they can literally, and as we've seen in many countries, say, well, I'll hand that one over to, you know. So politicians exist in a constant blame game scenario where everything they do and strategizing in terms of policy dimensions, political planning, performance, drama, views, are thinking about what are the likely consequences of this. And I sometimes wonder, particularly with COVID, the degree to which some of the leading scientists who agreed to take the stage realised that they were also being drawn into a wider blame game. And this is a, a really interesting element about accountability studies and the allocation of blame, is that when you're in, in the middle of a crisis, the great thing about a crisis is that the old rules suddenly go and you are able to do things, build relationships, move with agility and nimbleness and quickly. And that can be really, really great because you have to, because you're in a crisis. The challenge then comes when you move into a post-crisis phase where people want to say, well, gosh, you know, what happened and particularly what worked and what didn't work. And it's then that the allocation of blame happens. But also there's a danger of hindsight bias, that the accountability that takes place in the future doesn't understand what it was like to be an advisor, an expert, a politician, an official in that moment when somebody had to make decisions on the basis of imperfect information where people were likely to die, but somebody had to just take a decision. So COVID has been incredible for redefining and showing the potential of science to support policy and also to help scientists understand the culture and incentives of politics and policymakers and also politics of policymakers, I think, to understand science and how it works. The big concern, I think, coming down the line in the future is we are entering a post-COVID phase where accountability and scrutiny will be high on the agenda and everybody that stepped into the arena at the time will be expected to account for their advice and their decisions. And politicians will be far better and officials will be far better at playing that game. And I don't mean that in a, in a necessarily sort of I don't want to be rude or pejorative, but it, it is a game of presenting yourself in a positive light or maybe emphasising the pressures, the emotions of being in that time and telling a story. And, you know, lots of stories are being pre-prepared at the moment for the public inquiries that are being launched in many places and will be launched in many places around the world. One question for science and for scientists is how to engage with those processes in a positive manner, but one that is politically small p, politically astute to the games that other actors will play. Yeah, I, I wonder because, uh, so we can certainly talk in some detail about the future phase, the post-COVID phase, as you say, but thinking about what's been happening even during the evolution of the pandemic, there have been, in some countries, scientists and science advisors who already felt a bit uncomfortable as if they were being given the blame for decisions that were taken. 
And I guess in a way it's kind of natural if you are a liberal-minded political leader. Of course, the last thing you want to do is impose strict lockdowns on the population. I mean, it's a horrible thing to have to do. And so you want to be able to say then, and in a way accurately, look, this wasn't my idea. This is because of the situation, because of the science. But I think it's very easy to slide between it's because of the science, it's not my fault. And it's because of the scientist standing next to me, it's his fault. Yes, I, I think I think what's interesting is, first of all, you have had, I think for the first time ever, the explicit narrative of following the evidence, which is almost uh, a narrative form of blame displacement onto the scientists. Secondly, I do think this is probably the first global crisis where the experts have become, in many countries, the public face of the crisis. And thirdly, and I think this is interesting in terms of more sort of social political change, is that this isn't just about politicians and the experts. We live in a time now where the public can access and relate to the scientists directly. And we've had that in many countries where the scientists have received death threats, had to move house and have had a really rough time because elements of the public are blaming them or questioning their research in ways that are incredibly aggressive. Now, you can almost say that, well, yeah, COVID is a very extreme example, but I think it's possible to sort of position this example within broader debates around what some academics call the tyranny of relevance. The fact that nowadays academic scientific excellence is increasingly equated not just with pushing back the scholarly boundaries, but with being able to demonstrate that you played a direct role in some element of non-academic societal change. Now, overall, I'm broadly in favour of academics thinking more about the social relevance and potential of their work. But there is a flip side here that inevitably, if you put your head above the parapet of public life and political debate by suggesting that your research is relevant to one course of action or not another, then as soon as you do that, somebody is going to try and, well, you become politicised. And to some extent, there is nothing you can do about that. But I do wonder if science is quite caught up with that and does enough to prepare, particularly early career researchers coming into a scientific career with handling the pressures that come, can come with being. I mean, it's interesting just, just thinking aloud. I know this is a very dangerous thing to do. You know, we've always had a debate around the role of public intellectuals. And we've had a debate about the waning the demise of public intellectuals in many parts of the world for a whole number of different reasons and the argument that many of them actually went into the universities. But in a sense, you know, the public intellectuals worked across a very broad terrain of ideas and shaping and provoking and prodding and popping, whereas academics today are expected to make far more precise and scientifically rigorous contributions to debates in a ways that I think will shine the spotlight more tightly on them than may well have been faced by a, a broader, more traditional public intellectual. And of course, there are big issues here around equality and diversity and inclusion, that it's not just all scientists that are going to get uh, negative feedback. Unfortunately, women, people from uh, black or ethnic minority backgrounds, we've got the data on this they are likely to receive a far tougher time within the political sphere and particularly from the online public sphere. How do we make sure that we are able to not just cope, but I mean, there's also an area of academic literature on what's called anticipatory accountability. You know you've got to do something. You know that inevitably some people are not going to be happy with your decision. How can you think ahead to engaging with different constituencies in a way that maybe won't stop them from blaming you, but might help them understand 
why you came to the decision or the viewpoint that you had to come to. Almost, how can you take the heat out of accountability? So it isn't just about gotcha, but it's about, I don't like it, but at least I can understand now why you did it. And in a sense, that taps into a much broader debate that is rampant about the decline of civilised debate and discussion in countries all around the world. Absolutely. But I can just hear in my head your imaginary uh, classical philosopher of science or student of science advice. Now, the classical response to that kind of challenge going into it is to say, well, look, you draw the boundaries really clearly. Okay, You make it absolutely crystal clear what the role of the expert is and what the role of the decision maker is. So scientists report evidence. They tell it how it is. Uh, they might make recommendations, but these are all contingent on particular policy goals, which are not up to them. And then politicians decide. And there's an onus, I guess, in that situation on both sides, scientists and politicians, yeah. to make clear to everyone where that boundary is. The politician in particular has to say, OK, I've listened to the science and I'm making the following decision informed by what I've heard. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that is the classical kind of... Cop out. <laughs> I, I was going to say solution. So, I mean, maybe I've asked it in a leading way, but I think what you've already said has, has led us to that anyway. Do you think that's a plausible approach? Do you think it can really work in practice? Well, it's almost a sort of a, a classic view of the honest broker of experts and scientists, just laying the information at the door of the politicians who will then make the decisions. What I think we need to be more aware of, and I've been involved in, in, in helping to train scientists in this space, is that although we can have that image of the role of the scientist with clean hands and the role of the politician with dirty hands, and you know we can retain these boundaries, what I'm trying to explain through a focus on blame and blame games is that there will always be an incentive for some actors to try to muddy the boundaries on purpose. Yes, good point. So it doesn't matter as, as an academic, if you want to retain clear boundaries, the fact is that other people within that conversation, which will often be multiple conversations, some people will see benefits in either pulling you in or making those boundaries far more fuzzy. And I think also an issue there is that idea that you can be the honest broker maybe risks perpetuating this belief in the science and the experts, that the idea that I can present the science and politicians can use it, you know, the science will often be highly contested itself in terms of different scientific groups. And the politicians will need science advice on which science advice then to give most priority to. So, um, Yes, we can think about the role of the scientist as an honest broker, but we also need to be slightly more politically astute in being honest that politics and scientific advice into the, the you know, the science policy interface. Interface is, is great. It gives the idea that you plug in, you plug out. It's a, it's a technocratic process. In fact, that interface works through relationships. And relationships, again, as in personal life, they can be messy and they can be particularly messy in the political world. Now, that does not mean for one second that researchers, academic scientists shouldn't give policy advice to officials or ministers. I think it just underlines the need for them to be very clear and understand the game they're playing. And I can give you a very simple example here. Yes, please. In Whitehall and Westminster, there is an explicit phrase that is used and written into some documents. It's called the no surprises rule. And basically what that means is, I'm Matt Flinders, I'm a social scientist, uh, you're Toby, you're a minister or you're a, a special advisor to a minister. I'm gonna talk to you, Toby, you're gonna talk to me, we're gonna have a conversation. I'm gonna tell you what research I'm doing and why I think it matters to you. You might tell me a little bit about your plans as a minister what the minister is planning to do and get my sense of, well, how might that play out? But the no surprises rule is everything that we discuss is off the record and just between you and me until we agree otherwise. And what that allows us to do is to talk openly and freely. And 99% of the time, both sides of the no surprises rule will stick to the rule. 
that means that if I go away as an academic and want to write an academic paper or a blog where I use some insight or even a quote, wouldn't be a quote, but some information from our discussion, I would have to come back to you and say, Toby, look, I'm planning to write this blog. I want to say this. Are you OK with it? And what I'm doing there is stopping you from being surprised when you see a blog out which contains information that you told me. And just that no surprises rule is really, really important because I will often, if I'm, I met somebody for the first time yesterday, three senior civil servants from a government department about a new project. And the first thing I said to them was, we'll start this conversation by saying, this is all no surprises rule off the record between us. And as soon as I said it, you could see they relaxed. They understood the rules of engagement. And we had a really good chat, but we all knew what the rules were. I've explained this to lots of different academics from a whole range of different disciplines. And they've all said to me, well, why has nobody ever told me this before? You know, this explains so many of my negative experiences and the problems I've had. Because if you are working at that science policy interface, it is about trust. And if you break that trust or are even suspected of breaking that trust, it is very, very difficult then to rebuild. So I think there are ways that science itself, through training, professional career development, can support academics to be able to navigate some of these challenges in a slightly more astute way, which doesn't in any way diminish their academic standing. It doesn't dirty their hands. Basically, just as academia has rules and conventions and expectations, so does politics. But in politics, they're rarely as obvious as they might be when you're writing for a journal. Interestingly, on this, one of the things that we've just had in the UK is a fundamental review of the PhD in the social sciences. That, that's been developed and just published by the ESRC. Now, what I think is really great about that review is that one of the core recommendations is that all PhD students have to undertake some form of placement in a research related but research user environment. Now, that has to be done in a way that accepts that different people have different personal issues, they might have caring responsibilities. So, you know, we're not saying that everybody should go and spend six months in the European Commission on a stage or go into Whitehall or whatever, but we are saying there should be some two-way flow or interaction as part of the development of that broader professional skill set and understanding of the research user community. And I think that's a really important step in the right direction that um, fits with this broader discussion. When we talk about COVID and blame, we're sort of at the extreme end. But I think there are underneath that iceberg, under the water, there are a whole range of really important issues swirling around that are getting attention in different debates. That's really interesting. What a good idea. Huh. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about something you brought up a few minutes ago, but we haven't really focused on yet, which is this public inquiries phase. So like you say, countries around the world are now entering a phase or will soon be entering a phase where they want to kind of do a post-mortem, if that's not uh, too tasteless a metaphor, you know, to figure out what happened and who's responsible and who's to blame. How is that going to look? Okay, so what's interesting is we have already had a flood of parliamentary and congressional legislative committees of inquiry into elements of COVID all around the world. In the UK, in the House of Commons, I understand that there have so far been more than 60, 60 different inquiries by select committees into COVID-related topics. Just as you've seen a research steer towards COVID, now the accountability structures are themselves moving. So there's an interesting issue there about accountability overload, but parliamentary committees are obviously working in a far more politicised environment with different aims and ambitions. What you've seen happen more recently is the creation of independent public inquiries that are created explicitly to be detached from day-to-day -day partisan politics and to work in a different, slower deeper and theoretically more of a focus on lesson learning than the allocation of blame or gotcha. In reality, though, if you look at the literature on public inquiries, 
it actually concludes that they're a very bad mechanism for lesson learning and are actually tend to be drawn more towards blame allocation. So the question there is, and I'm working with the International Public Policy Observatory on this project, how might we design a public inquiry model that did look back at what went wrong? And if people need to be held to account and blamed, then that's part of political life. But how might it balance that without losing a focus on the more future orientated and more positive lesson learning insights that will get totally lost if the inquiries degenerate into a total blame game. Interesting on this, I mean, you know, Dominic Cummings has made some very interesting statements, um, actually almost engaging in a blame game of pre-preparing the public inquiry with thoughts, seeding thoughts into the inquiry process, even though it's not been formally established yet, and actually saying that the Prime Minister used the Chief Scientific Advisor as a human shield to deflect blame. So this broader issue that we've talked about, about the role of experts, the role of science, what advice underpinned what decision when, on what basis, will all inevitably become key elements of the inquiries. Now, what's really interesting is we may end up with multiple public inquiries at different levels in multiple countries all at the same time. And one of the big questions is, what are those inquiries for? We started at the beginning talking about social psychology and the role of politicians acting as lightning rods for social frustration, anger, disappointment. It's quite clear that public inquiries around the world are often used as a cathartic process to deal and express things that have gone badly wrong, reconciliation hearings. So there's a big issue around what do you actually want the public inquiry? What are its primary objectives? Is it cathartic social healing? Is it lesson learning? Is it blame allocation? And it can't do everything all at once. There will be trade-offs between those different objectives. And also, how do you support an inquiry? How do you allow an inquiry to bring in different sources of evidence from a wide range of communities? How do you move an inquiry away from being a legalistic model with a single chairperson getting down into the great detail, but using a very legalistic judicial model? Now, of course, if you look at some recent public inquiries, they've been more innovative in how they invite and accept evidence from affected communities. But the traditional is a fairly narrow tool of accountability. And so what I'm really interested in is how might some design thinking be injected into how we think about public inquiries so that they can deliver a deeper, richer source of insight and not a narrow, sharp, highly emotional focus on blame. Sounds good. There's also the danger of going mad, which is quite interesting. The danger of going mad? Danger of going mad. This is a, another substrand of the academic literature <laughs> called multiple accountabilities disorder. Okay. Basically, what this shows is that too much accountability can be as problematic as too little. If you are running an organisation, and in particular if it's a large, complex or politically salient organisation, it's likely that you will be held to account. But if you are held to account by lots of different organisations or external bodies that each require very different types of information and each have potentially different punishments or penalties that they can impose on you, the risk is that the organisation goes mad. The senior management team become overly focused on dealing with these external accountability mechanisms and distracted from the day-to-day -day running of the organisation. So things go wrong. Things go wrong. The accountability body says, well, things are going wrong. We need more accountability. We need to keep a tighter hold on you. And what happens is a spiral happens. Now, with COVID, multiple accountability is a little bit different because the COVID inquiries won't be looking at a single organisation as such. But there is an issue here that all of the different inquiries will generally want to talk to a fairly small number of key people that are involved in the decision-making bodies. And 
how do we allow those that are still serving politicians or senior officials to cope with those accountability demands on them in a high pressure context with lots of media interest while also going around their day to day job of running the Department of Health and Social Care or whatever, whatever. So there's a need to sort of manage or think about the dispersal of accountability demands on people and on organisations so that the whole system doesn't create new pathologies that make failure to some extent even more inevitable. And indeed, as you mentioned already, uh, in the different contexts, the need to equip people with the skills to deal with that kind of situation, which is all very well. But, you know, we are where we are. We have a bunch of scientists who've been in this position, for better or worse, and have managed it as best they can and will now shortly be staring down the barrel of public inquiry. Not the best phrase. <laughs> well, okay, <laughs> facing public inquiries. But you mentioned that politicians are savvy or can get savvy in how to handle these situations because they swim in these waters all the time. Yeah, yeah. What yeah. kind of lessons can scientists learn from them? Well, okay, so any official or minister, if they're called to give evidence before one of these public inquiries, they will undertake days, if not weeks, of detailed, focused preparation and training so that they are fully able to respond to every question from every angle on any topic on the ball. It's just not the real world to expect members of SAGE or scientific advisors or academics who come in. They are not going to be that prepared or supported in any way. Now, what can be done in this situation? I think, in a way, this takes me back to this notion of anticipatory accountability. I think that there's a a broader challenge and a broader opportunity here for the scientific community to actually use COVID as a benchmark to cultivate a public conversation about the limits of science and the role of science in society and why, in many ways, some things went really well with COVID, vaccine rollout, vaccine development, but also why some things went wrong. In many ways, if you could ensure, and this is incredibly naive and utopian, in many ways, the best case scenario would be that the public inquiry processes happen within an environment that has almost been pre-prepared with a balanced and evidence-based understanding at a more mature level of the limits of science and the inevitable trade-offs that exist and affect the science advice that is given so that then the inquiry can take place in a slightly more mature space. Now, I don't think that is something that's possible to do in the short or medium term that is really going to affect the current public inquiries. But I do think the lesson will be more long term for the scientific community to use the COVID experience and personal stories and insights from it to help inform and nurture that deeper public debate and public understanding of the limits of science and the role of scientists. And I mean, maybe just to finish off, the stakes are quite high here, right? Not just for the individuals involved, but also in a way, as a whole, we've gained a lot during the COVID experience. We've built a lot of relationships, we've developed more of a mature understanding, I think, especially among ordinary citizens about how evidence informs policy and the role of science in democracy. Um, and we risk to lose some of that if the blame game now goes off the rails or to preserve it if we handle things carefully. Yeah, I mean, the COVID has established lots of new relationships, not lots of new structures and has almost cast a new positive light on science and the science policy interface. The danger of the uh, public inquiries is that they might muddy that positive light in ways that are politically calculated, but not helpful for the long term relationship between science and policy. Um, the only thing I would say there is that if you look at the data, the public surveys, um, science is still highly regarded and trusted by the public and politicians are generally at the bottom of the trust tree or one up from, um, I think it's the state agents that always come in second to politicians. So I think in many ways, 
scientists enjoy a significant body of social capital with the public. And although there will be blame games played by politicians seeking to deflect responsibility onto the science or scientists, I personally can't imagine that that is going to be something that will be fundamentally damaging for science. I think actually what we're really focusing on here is supporting individual scientists and also thinking about what are the broader structural positive opportunities that COVID creates once we've got. In many ways, we've gone from the during the crisis, we're now looking at the pre crisis accountability phase. What we need to be thinking of really now is beyond the public inquiries and how do we embed positive lesson learning now for the future. So we've got to stay, the scientists have got to stay one head of the game that they are being drawn into. Whether scientists and the scientific community are sufficiently attuned and aware of that need, I'm not too sure. Hmm. Well, I guess time will tell. And the work that people like you are doing hopefully will play a role in making sure that turns out better rather than worse. Absolutely. And we've had a lot of uh, early days, I wouldn't say success, but the work that I'm doing with IPO on trying to think about creatively and innovating when it comes to public inquiry design and highlighting the potential pathologies of accountability in order not to let the focus on blame completely outweigh a focus on lesson learning, we are actually talking with senior officials and politicians all around the world. And again, you know, it tends to be slow burn, quiet, hidden work, but it's been very, very well received. And I think that, again, shows the capacity for um, science to have an impact, not just on policy, but on scrutiny, which is a very different dimension that we don't normally talk about. We talk about evidence-led policy and impact case studies are about how we've usually informed policy. Supporting scrutiny by academics is a lot harder. Yeah, well, the best of luck with that work then. And uh, it's just about time for me to say, Professor Matthew Flinders, thank you very much indeed for shedding some light and even some optimism on the murky world of political accountability and blame. It's been a great conversation. Thank you. No problem. Enjoyed it. The Science for Policy podcast is produced by SAPEA. We're a consortium of Europe's academies and learning societies, and we're part of the European Commission's scientific advice mechanism. We provide evidence and expertise to inform the work of the group of chief scientific advisors. SAPEA is funded by the EU's Horizon 2020 programme for research and innovation, and you can find lots more information about us and our work at sapea.info. Finally, the rather lovely cello music that's playing right now is performed by Elizaveta Sushchenko. So I shall shut up and let you enjoy the last few bars. Bye for now.